challenge we all have is nobody knows where the peak is until after the fact. Unless you've got a crystal ball, there's just no way to know it. But being at peak is in a phase. Either you're going up or you're going down. It's very rare to be right at that moment of equilibrium. And so when we talk about equilibrium analysis for office, remember, equilibrium is not to say that you are searching for the equilibrium, but you need to figure out what the timeline is to get to it. Because you'll never get to it. You'll just hopefully be part of that cycle. Okay, folks, maybe I should have put this up. You all read that chapter, number seven, on retail leases. So there are three different kinds of retail leases. And it's interesting, today you're we listening in an industrial deal that wasn't about the retail lease, but he had some leases that functioned like a retail lease. The perfect preferred type of lease in retail leasing is triple net. N, 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 basically all expenses. Now the reason the word, do you know where the triple net came from? Three N's. Yeah, right, there's what do they stand for? There's a double net. net. So what's the double and the single net thing? It has to do with one's taxes, one's common area maintenance, and one's insurance. Uh, <laughs> so you know, which ones you pay? It and and in truth, it it's one. It could be one of them. Clearly, his taxes is one. Operating costs is another, and all the other kinds of pass-throughs generally were the third. And it was just a way of saying nothing falls to the developer's bottom line, all get passed through. And that's what makes a lease in retail leasing very different from here. I'm going to cover this up for a moment. So look, office leases, the gross lease means that they pay a rent, a tenant pays a rent, and then the taxes, the operating expenses are absorbed by the landlord. And what made it really interesting, and we didn't hear it, but I'm guessing, that the $18 or the $20 that are paid by office tenants in the buildings next door, those are probably gross leases. While he's getting 14 net. So it's even bigger disparity between and amongst that. Net lease, not a triple net lease, but a net lease means there's usually a base rent plus some share of expenses. And then expense stocks. What are expense stocks? Does anybody really know? No? You know? Yeah, I, you spend a certain amount of expenses, and at that point, like your insurance, once you reach your thousand dollar, you don't have to spend any more. No, not quite. So, so it's an it's a item to protect the landlord from having to pay more than a certain amount. Everything beyond that has to be paid out. Later. Right, so it's not the tenant. You got the right concept, but the wrong party there. And it's really about the base rent, if you will, that, that base, excuse me, the extent stop is basically, all right, I will absorb 10 bucks a square foot, everything else is yours. So there is no protection for the tenant. But landlords love it because now you know exactly what your net operating income is for the deal and you can figure out your net service coverage ratios, you can manage your way through your net cash flow. How many people put in percentage rent? I, I worded it different, but... Oh, what was your wording? My wording was uh, tenants are charged based on business income. And it's interesting, that's not really correct. And so percentage rent is based on sales, not business income. This is a yeah, huge yeah. difference. I was going to do one of the two. So, and why do you think we would look to a tenant's sales as opposed to their income. Because if they're doing bad, I guess if, they're, if their business isn't doing that good, you don't want to take away from them so they can't afford to stay in the... Oh, I want to take away from them, but all I want to get is my rent. Because they could fudge the bottom line with expenses that are not really expensive. Any other answers? You're closer, but not quite there. Because if that is what you operate on... I'm sorry, what? what? You want to base on income. So, no, you don't want to base it on income. Because if they're high performing, you want to pay you more? They don't want to go through the So, it's interesting that you're saying this. So, part of the concept, and this is why uh, I ask how, you know, I, I, I ask these questions because I want to see how closely you read it. Think about this. All right, Claudius, you're running a business. 
you're selling, I don't know what, you're selling eyeglass cases, you're making a million bucks a year, and let's say the percentage rent is 6% for those sales. That's easy to see. We can look at your sales receipts, or we can go to Tula and the restaurants and say, I know how much you're actually bringing in. But now, I don't know what you're paying your employees. I don't know whether you're cooking the books. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. And so here, if you Creative just take, if you, well, and if you take the top level line, then you've got a validated, verifiable way to look at the opportunity. Yes? What percentage do they usually take from the sales? What's like average, is there like an average percentage or just ranges? Gosh, it can be all over the map. And I've seen percentage that can range 6 to 10%. It depends on what kind of retailer. Um, if you are a small retailer, it's often a higher percentage because the issue there is then you can do the percentage rent for, uh, on, based on sales, or you can do the percentage rent and say, oh, I've got a base rent, whether it's proven or not. And let's say, we'll go back to Claudius's eyeglass shop. He's got a thousand square foot shop, and let's say his rent is 50 bucks a square foot. All right, so that's $50,000 a year. But as soon as he gets above that million dollars, in fact, that's an artificial number, there's an, a better way to call it a natural break point. As soon as his sales, let me change my number, $60 a square foot, that's $60,000. But as soon as he exceeds a million bucks, he's on percentage rent, and so if he's under a million bucks, he pays $60,000, and as soon as he goes over it, he's paying. And the reason why landlords, especially retail, does it because retail owners are marketing the center, they're managing a whole host of marketing benefits, and they're sharing, in effect, in the profits because they're bringing the traffic to the center. So all these kinds of leases can be found in retail leases, except it's the percentage rent that makes the big difference. The ones that I've seen have ceilings on them, is that normal as far as how much of the sales they can get, or, or are there plenty of them that get? It depends how strong you are in your, in your leasing. So for example, the 1,500 square foot Apple store at the Gardens Mall <coughs> takes in something on the order of, if I get my numbers right, um, <coughs> $30 million a quarter. I mean, phenomenal rent, phenomenal sales per square foot. So I can assure you that Apple probably has a cap with Simon Properties. But if you're a small eyeglass shop, you probably don't get to say that. But it's another thing, yeah. Is modified growth acceptable for 3A? Oh, you're looking to see if I'm gonna give you a check for a correct answer. Well, no, I'm just asking if it would be acceptable. So, so, <laughs> so gee, modified gross. Um, uh, so, there's also industrial gross. So, you know, I'm looking at the concept of is it a gross lease? I, and yes, you can always modify it. And how do I modify the gross lease with expense stops or net lease? I'll think about it. What do you think, doctor? It's possible. It's possible. Well, the reason is I, I don't want sloppy thinking. Well, okay. I'm serious. It's like, okay, hey folks, what kind of lease do I have? Oh, it's a, uh, it's a gross lease or it's a modified gross lease. What are you going when you're up here teaching in ten or fifteen or twenty years? What are you going to say to your students? Uh, no, I'm not disagreeing with you. I no, I'm trying to learn. No, that's right. Yeah. And so, so I'm trying. I mean, there's. There's, you can complicate every one of these leases, but if you just look at that, yeah. those are the three different kinds of okay. lease formats, and then you can come up with all sorts of things. And the reason why I put in this question is because percentage rent is the key differentiator on retail leases, and it's based on sales, not income. And that's really important. So if you've got one but not the other, then yeah. okay. All right, what are factors that make an MSA tick? Before I give you my answers there. Well, a whole population. bunch of things. Population. Bunch? Yes. Demographics. Household yeah. income. All right, so the key for me was how you explain it. So I just put up a bunch of factors here because, of course, population impacts growth and distribution, employment.
human impacts the rank and the size. Agglomeration, I've been talking about that for everybody today, right? Clustering has a huge impact on sales and activity. Anybody mention export industries in your basic sector? Remember, the more export industries you have, the better it will be. This is not a market analysis class. When you get top markets, next semester. It's, going next be, semester. it's going to be key to figuring out how you understand your sub-markets and whether there's employment and other opportunities for your office, residential, and other users. Incomes, government incentives. So the talk was in my presentation before. Okay, I want to go to the next question because this is where the fun begins. All right, so I'd like someone to explain to me how they got to the answer in number seven before I show number seven. You can explain to you. I don't even put it up. This is, once again, we're back to basic math, but it's really important to help you get to it. Who would like to take a crack at this? All right, sir, let's go right ahead. Uh, so, you have $12,500 a month. In a year, that would be $150,000. Okay. So, that's annual. And then your potential um, gross income. Uh, 25% of the potential gross income is your uh, operating expense. So, that's $37,500. Uh, you subtract 150 from 37,500 and you get a hundred, uh, 112,500. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know the answer. I was just waiting to see if you can What's your EGI? Yeah. So, effectively, yes. <coughs> okay. That's right. And then you I keep going. You do your loan to value um, ratio. I mean, um, the DB, uh, your DSCR to get your debt service coverage ratio. Why do you choose that instead of the loan to value? Anybody want to help Emmanuel out? Yeah, you, really, you don't exactly know how much your total is. Not only do you not exactly know, you have no friggin' idea what the value of the building is. So you can't use that. So which one did you use, Emmanuel? Did you use the debt service coverage ratio or the loan to value? I used the 1.35 mm -hmm. debt service. Okay. Right. Okay, so you did that, and then what comes out of that? What number? Uh, 83,333. 83, 83, 83, Correct. 3. Okay. That's right. Basically, it's this number divided by 1.35. Right? Yeah. And then All right, so he's so far, so good, right? All of you are with me? Yes. You all got that far? <coughs> Except I do it on a monthly basis. Just a second. Keep going. And then you do monthly, uh, divided by 12, you get 6,944. Right, okay. And what do you now do with that number? You, get your you stick it in the top. Magic. Okay. All right, that wasn't too hard, right? No. So now if you run through the numbers, then now what's your value for the loan that you can actually place on this building? 931,423. That's it. How many people think that's the right answer? Isn't it? I put 900,000. Just like 70%. So, so <coughs> I'm just curious, Victor, why did you just put 900,000? Um, I, I honestly didn't, I don't know how you got to the 931, so I was just plugging in numbers until I got close to what the monthly mortgage payment would be. Because I didn't know how to figure out how okay. to the 8, 8, All right, so that means if you're just driving down the street and you're just trying to think through it, it's not a bad way to look at life because ultimately you say, you know what, my monthly payment's seven grand. What's my interest? I can work backwards and yeah. probably figure out I need a loan of about 900000 So I'll give you a little credit, but you kind but of work you, backing into can it. Can you please explain like, how do you get from the agent to find that number? Are <coughs> you doing well on the calculator? I don't know how to do it. All right. Turn the calculator on. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't being funny. 
And so basically, and hopefully I can do it because I use the better calculator, the E3 call C. And so we put in the 6944 as our payment. Right, folks? So I think it's important. Here, let's just do something here. And, and without us calculating it, because the calculator do it, even Dr. Forgy is letting the calculator do it for him. Right, sir? Absolutely. So these happen to be the four different elements in our present value calculation. To get the present value, which is the amount of the loan, the present value basically has to know, we have to know our payment, our interest, and our number of periods, if you will. And so this is a little bit just slightly misleading, but we'll just because it says it there, we don't just say that interest, okay? We know our we know what our payment is. So Victor, we just put that in. Okay. What else do we know? We know our interest rate. So you're just putting the 5.5 in. Remember, because we are doing it monthly. And then the end was what? 10 years? Actually, I'll put whatever number of years. 6.5. Like 6.5, I'm sorry. Okay. So when we get to that, and then out comes this number in your calculator. Except that you got to convert to the month. Well, but of course, so oh. so this is the monthly amount. That's correct. And so with this, yes, you're right. You got to do 6.5 divided by 12. Exactly. And you got to do 20 divided by 12. Multiplied by 12. So, by 12. Multiply. Thank you, sir. So it's 240, and then this becomes 6.5 divided by 12. You could come up with an angle, but I think the problem said monthly, and most banks will calculate your amortization on a monthly basis. So that may have been the easiest of the problems, right, guys? So Erica, you have a scrunchie on your face. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out um, the present value, because the interest rate is the amount of money. I'm trying to figure out how you got so to calculate this, everything in. This number came out of your calculation in your and I guess you've got the app on, the, on your phone, is what you're saying. So it's basically saying, yes, if you spend $83,000 a year at 6.5% interest, but we're calculating it on, on a, uh, a monthly basis over 20 years, this will support a loan. So actually, you can work it the other way. And what you'd like to do, if you want to see how this works, is you can actually put in your present value of your loan amount of $931,000. You put in your interest at 6.5% divided by 12. You put in your number of periods multiplied by 12. Uh, uh, by 12, so that's 20, 240. And out will come this payment amount. In fact, the payment amount will come with a negative sign because it's basically going out the door as opposed to money that's coming in, which is this amount that you're getting in the bank. Did yes, you your present, would you put your present value at, at one? Or at negative, negative one, you just leave the present value blank. Um, if, 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 if you know the present value, which I would just put it in, I would put it in just basically PV is equal to 931 for it. Oh, oh okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So he, he times that payment times 240 to get your how much? How much? This is how much? Because we're doing everything monthly. And I don't remember what this is. It comes out to uh, 5 or something. something. The, the, the question is, how large of a loan amount can you obtain? Yes, and so the present that. value is the loan amount. Uh, I may be off. I was just listening to whatever he said. So I'm not worried about two or three hundred dollars. So present value is the loan amount. So. Don't don't let that confuse you, Alex. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you see how the loan I could take. So, bottom line, I, the nine thirty one should be the seventy percent of the loan, and then I'm putting in thirty percent of the deal. You know, I need to work with you. I'm putting down thirty percent, and then you have nine hundred thousand. Right, but you you can't get to one thing that you can do. So, work the numbers back. Let's just think. If you've got nine thirty one as the amount of the loan. You still don't know you what your present value is you or your value of the, of the deal. I, saw, I, I went to the numbers and I figured it out. I got it down pretty close to the $3. Dollars. 
Pretty close. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, for it. it was a few dollars off the end of the day. That was $10 off. I knew that. I figured out that I had $9,000, $3,000. My payments seemed to be low as to six nine four four per month. So I got as close as I got to six nine three four per month. That's my payment. And I know that that was, was $1.3 of that is $930,000. Uh, so I mean, it the question was a little misleading in a sense where if you're asking for how large of a loan can I take out? Uh, that's actually 74%. I mean, I have the exact numbers right here. But yeah, so it, it's, it's a little bit different. That's right. I mean, I designed the problem so it would be close so you can see what you do. So in the aggregate, the bank will probably say they won't care about 100, 200, 300, or even $1,000. No, I have 9316. No, I don't exact that. number, but I understand it's that. Saying, you know, and, 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 and the truth is, what's usually going to happen is the bank, Brad, you can contradict me, the bank will say, you know, the amount rounded to $930,000 or some number like that. The goal here is to make sure you know how to calculate what it is ultimately. It's a process. It's a process. That's right. And the, the, the issue here is that, see, someone may not give you the loan to value. Well, so you still have to know how to do it yeah, this way. Okay. That's the reason why I get that. And also, there's one little thing to sort of point out here. This is not going to be the last time you see this. You will see this probably a hundred plus times over the course of the program. So you either learn it now and are able to excel in the program, or you try to avoid it now and you're going to stumble all the way through. Okay. So this is not one of those things that you just kind of just say, I, I don't understand it, I'm just going to ignore it. It's not going to go away. Well, just make sure that's clear. And, and yes, you can guess, but guessing doesn't get you to the exact answer. Only after many years can you just say, hey, I think I know what it is. Here's why. And so now that you could come to it, but in fact, you got there through a different process. All right, so who's, who wants to tell us how to get the, uh, the right number in the next problem? Uh, how many square feet are we looking for here? Who would like to go, take me through the problem? Thank you, Emmanuel. You got us very far, which is excellent. Come on, I'm going to volunteer somebody if you don't want to volunteer. Oh, so, all right, Brandon, you got your. All right. Thing. Um, all right, well, I did. Well, this, well, I guess I got the acre drawn, so it wouldn't be right. I put 43,000. So, uh, that's the number of square feet, kind of, but not quite an acre. But, Alex, I'll hold off on you for a moment. I want someone else. I guess. I will. All right, let's see if Claudius, but I don't want guesses, I want real formulas. I. Uh, I, I took acre at round number 43,600. I will use your new base 10 <laughs> or base 12. All right. And I, I uh, took the square root of that and uh, I got 2,008.81 right, so as the dimensions for a square so, lot. So basically what you're saying is we had five acres and your math is a little bit off because we all know the right number. Yes, he's off by 40. And by the way, the surveyor would not like you if you've gotten the number wrong. I understand. All right. You. All right. And so what was your number here? Two, seven, eight, five. Two, eight. What was it? Claudius' number. We'll go by his, his number. Two, zero. Oh. Well, what I did was I went through one acre and then multiplied by five. All right. And your total was? Um, was 208.81. All right. Close enough. And then what did you do? And uh, and then I uh, took a hundred off. Hundred so off of what? Off of that. Off of the two hundred eight. Yes. So let's get this right, folks. Right Five because acres times the square footage equals the total number of square feet. Right. So why would you take a hundred off of this two hundred eight thousand mm -hmm. square square foot number? No, no, no. I, I got two hundred eight point eight one. Remember, I'm working with one acre. And then I'm going to multiply Very by interesting. Five. So now I understand what he did. So you basically <coughs> discovered that your property was 208 feet correct. inside. Exactly. And the actual correct number is what, folks? He's close. All right, keep going. And then <laughs> I don't think anybody else has a number. Then, then I took uh, 100 off of that because we have 50 on all around the setback. So I ended up with 108, mm -hmm. and then I square that and 
multiplied it by five. And so what did you get? Uh, I I started questioning the acreage, so I didn't get that bottom line. I started questioning. I right, agree. Right. So you got far, but not all the way to the end. Right. The surveyor still was having trouble. With you. <laughs> Who got to the end of the game, folks? This is really basic in many important ways. There are lots of ways to get to it, by the way. You'll get to the use to the fact that, of course, an acre on a side. And if an acre is 43,560 square feet, how do you figure out what the size of a rectangle is for that? So Claudius gave us the clue. You figure out what the square root is of that number, essentially. OK, so he got close to it, 208 feet on a side. So now you're going to look at the square root of the actual acreage on this particular property. So the actual acreage was, or square footage was 207,000, something like that. And this gives you a number of 469 feet on each side. Then you take 100 feet, because remember, if you look at our box, we're basically just taking 50 feet on all sides, right? So now 469 becomes, I'm rounding my numbers, 369. Then what do I do? I multiply 369 by 369. And I end up with 134,462 square feet, which, oh, by the way, is just a hair over three acres. So, hey, isn't that interesting? I got a five acre square. I lop 100 square feet, 100 feet linearly on any side, it becomes three. I apologize. Can you run through that one time? Yeah. I, mean, I got the total square footage. Alright, you got the total square footage. And actually, let me see. Do you have a square root function? Yes. Square root yes. Okay. So everybody's calculator, <coughs> basically you're putting in the number. And you're looking to do the square root. The square root basically is, of course, you take the number and you're multiplying it on its own stuff. So 466, 467, I don't remember the exact number right here that I got to it. But that's how I got to this number. All I did was simply look at the square. The key here was knowing how to find the size of the square, and then lopping off 100 feet of that number, and then multiplying that resulting number by itself again. And, and if you're wondering why this is so important, this particular type of problem, because whenever you go into local government to actually get approval to build on a property, in many instances, they will have very specific setback requirements of where you cannot build, they will have height limitations, they will have all of these constraints that ultimately limit the, literally the building envelope on the side. And so here so it's a very specific number, and if the floor area ratio that's permitted by the builder is, or by the, the city or the county government is 0.25, if they say you can put one square feet of building for every four of land, that's what a 0.25 floor area ratio is, then I know the size of my building. Once you know the size of the land, then you can calculate what your building size needs to be. Because, like, for example, today's guest speaker, one of the things you heard him say about the, the potential office building location is they were limited to 40,000, roughly 40,000 square footage of office space, but it could be a two-story building or a three-story building, but they are limited to that square footage by virtue of the regulations. Okay. And you as developers want to get every last square foot you can for your building. You know, here's another way to think of it, by the way, if you had 10 acres, 10 acres is basically, you know, penny on the side, if you will. 
And so that's 435,600 square feet. And it's fascinating, you can look at these numbers, and every time you reduce it, it's, it's logarithmic. You can basically go 1, 3, 5, 10 every time you change it by 100 feet. It's just a, a, you know, you just learn these kinds of rules of how to do the numbers. But you need to get the exact number because your attorney, your appraiser, your surveyor are all going to say, how, can I, how much of a building can I do? All right, who wants to really get to the heart of the matter? Who wants to take us to that? Extra credit. I'm sorry. All right, we're going to let Victor do number nine. Um, All right, folks. Let's let's listen up. Victor. Uh, so I first figured out the NOI. I did the uh, twenty-five thousand square feet times seventeen dollars and fifty cents, and we're asking. Um, That's equal to what? That is equal to three seven. Uh, thirty-seven thousand five hundred. No, no, no. Four thirty-seven five hundred. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that is the printout? It's cutting out my notes on the side, so I don't know. Four three seven. Okay. Four. Yeah, I guess so. Four three seven five. Um, and then we have uh, ninety percent occupancy. So I multiplied that by ninety. Ninety percent, and then I got uh three hundred ninety. $1,750 of effective income. Uh, and then I subtract that by, uh, uh, what is this? Yeah, uh, 137500 which was expensive. And then I got the NOI of uh, 256250 Everybody got that? Yep. yep. Um, I don't see yeses up here, over here. No. You know, I have a question here. I didn't. I didn't. It says here. In my mind, it says that when you, you need to maintain 90 percent, you need to build money into it. So, I, in my mind, it says right here that it's all is leasable. You see, it's maintain 90 percent. If you're on you don't want to add 90 percent. You're 100 percent according to. When I read the question, you're 100 percent. That's an interesting reading, but not the correct one. Well, I understand. So, yeah. I wrong, okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the language is is not meant to trick you. There are lots of different ways to do it. Actually, I was trying to I changed the language to clarify it this time. This is the same essential problem that we had the last time. But now, Victor, you're going with me on the next yeah, step. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so then, to find the next uh, answer, I added the a million three seventy five plus the five hundred sixty thousand. Um, and I got 1.935, uh, and then we have a 75% loan ratio, so I multiplied that by 75% and I got 1.45125. Um, and then I plugged that in to the whole number equation. So this is equal to what on your calculator? As, as what? So. This number is, this is your? Oh, the loan. The, the loan. The loan. And so now if you want to calculate your payment. Right, so then I plug that in. Into what, what cell, what, what button on your calculator? Uh, uh, the one to hear him. Uh, well, I did it, so I know I should not. Okay. So it's the present value again. Right, okay, oh. the present value. So I just want to make sure you're consistent because okay. the loan, value, in this case, we're looking at the present value of the loan, not the present value of the building, not the present value of our investment. And then from there, what happened? Um, so yeah, plug that in, and then the 5.5 interest rate with the, with the uh, was it 10 years. And then I got a monthly payment of 15749 um, And then I multiplied that by 12, and I got uh, 188900 Okay. That is my maximum criminal loan for the year. So that's our annual payment, right folks? Right. So that means, how do you get to the next line? Uh, then I subtract the NOI and the maximum permitted loan, and I get my... Oh, so you subtract one? Wait, what? I subtract... Oh, I subtract the permitted loan from the NOI, and I get the net cash flow. So the formula, so that's right. 
right? Yeah. Is that, I wrote it down here, I'm trying to... So, basically, an OI minus debt service right. equals net cash flow. Right. I could have put that formula on and you all would have gotten it, right? But you should know that by now. And so then the number for the net cash flow is? Uh, 67252. There you go. And then return on cost is. So how do you calculate return on cost? And here's where we can get creative. Let's give Victor a break. Who wants to tell me the return on cost? Manuel, we already had your chance. Let's give you somebody else. All right, Frederick. The NOI is a tri-plane service. And? Oh, the NOI uh, uh, 256 uh, track is uh, 6725 Yes, but so we're trying to look at the return. Uh, divided by the, the cost of the budget, total cost of the budget is uh, 1375. Of returns do investors expect on a class A building? 
Higher returns than, than what? Everybody else opposite. agree with that? Yeah. yeah. You're wrong. <laughs> so when a Class A building, which by the way, great tenants, great location, great finishes, low operating expenses, recently built. Okay. Is there a lot of risk in a property like that? No. 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 And so if there's lower risk, investors will generally demand a lower return. So when the property is worse off, when it's class B or class C, the risk is greater. That's why when Dr. Forge presented this problem, and we had to do it last week, it's a class C building, piece of junk. That's all I own. I see. And the because it's, return. it's great stuff. Because the returns are high and he knows how to manage the risk because he's a direct manager and investor, just like Mike today. He is on top of everything that's going on at that particular property. Would you call that a class A property? Class B or class C, folks? C. Pardon? C. What makes it a C property? <coughs> All right, anybody else have an answer besides Victor? Erica? I would say B. B, why? I think the location. Well, I live out there, so maybe I'm biased. Uh -huh. But is a good location. And I think the amenities, maybe the maintenance wasn't up to par, but. Okay. All right, Alex? Well, it would put crap. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, all right. so, and Chadwick, you would like to say. Alright, right, so, and Steve, I'm sure you have an opinion. Yeah, I'll pick B. I mean, the rents were kind of in line with the market, finishes were not oh. spectacular. With their, like, and one, the last one is A, B, or C. The depreciation of the building, say, depends on that. I don't know. But we're not dealing with after tax or depreciation or anything. We're dealing with the physical asset itself. I mean, it depends on the age of the building. So I think Dr. Forty and I would say it's a class B, B plus, maybe actually. It, it, it's clearly how they're going to run it and how they're going to fix it. It's going to be a good asset. But you're right, Erica. The location is kind of, I don't know, not easy to get there. How many of us got lost on the way? <laughs> we did. Okay? And, and, and that's not good for accessibility. And one of the great things about highway visibility, it's wonderful, but you often can't get there from so the thing that's interesting about this is, well, gee, if it was a Class A building, what are cap rates on Class A buildings? You all now have looked at all that REIS data, all that real capital analytics data. What kind of cap rates do you see on Class A office buildings in the United Seven, States? Eight. Huh? Five, six. Really low. Even lower. So now you begin to say, well, gee, if this was my return on cost, once again, if we're accepting this definition, then, okay, and my return on equity at 13 point something percent, that's an excellent return for a class A building. Last thing I want to mention is that if we actually calculated this on our NOI, all of a sudden, what does it say if this was your way you're looking at the building? Without leverage, basically no debt, and if you have 13 point two something percent in debt, 13.9%. What does that tell you about debt in this particular case? If your returns are the same, you're not getting any benefit from not getting any benefit from leverage. The only reason why we use leverage really is, well, yeah, if we don't have the money, but it increases our returns generally. And this is why actually I prefer, you know, this calculation as a comparison. But not everybody looks at that way too. Like. I did have a major problem because I never saw it like that. I considered that about 70000 a year, we paid down our principal. So the real expense is only the interest. Why wouldn't we consider that as a return on investment? I mean, if I was to sell it a year later, I wouldn't have to pay those 70000 This is why you may do well in the finance class. Because the issue is you do want to figure out over time, and that's why we look at internal rates of return, we look at amortization. I just gave you a snapshot, but you're right. It, this may be great. Look, we're paying down 
the, the principal, and we can man, we like that 3% or whatever because, boy, it's just putting money in the bank. So I deducted the interest expense, and I offered two scenarios. If we look at it that way, I came up with actually 6% because we paid down the principal, too, and that rate, not 3 I, I give you a check mark for creativity because, in fact, that's a great way of looking at the building code because she's trying to think the next step, though her number is kind of a, you know, it's a little bit of a guesstimate, yes? I, I, I said that basically because you can pay off your uh, rate of equity since it's a lot. You basically pay it off in seven years. You're about the time you're looking to sell or maybe maintain, but after that you're collecting a lot of money. Well, so. um, let's see. That $931,000 you can pay, I'm not 931, excuse me. Um, what was the total amount of debt? Hmm, that's a good question. So, hmm. I don't know if you're going to pay it off quite that quickly. Because remember, we're looking at a loan that is... No, 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 not your debt. You're, you're just getting all of your equity back at the end. So, um, so. Okay. And then after that... Right. But, but So, once again, we're looking at a snapshot. And so, this was the back of the envelope. <coughs> so, yes, market positioning is key. Let's just go to the last, very last one. Come on, folks. If the rate of return is specified, whatever your required rate of return, if your IRR is greater than your rate of return, what do you do? What's your action as an investor when your internal rate of return that you can get on a building? If the internal rate of return was 20% on a building, and your investors said, you know what? I just want to earn 15%. So IRR, greater than your required rate of return. So what is, what, what's your answer? Proceed. Go. Yeah. Go with the deal. Invest. All right, what if the two are equal? Edge. Proceed. Yeah. 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 Look for yeah. leverage. Yeah. You know, it's almost like yeah. it depends. It's a toss up unless there are really compelling factors. Yeah. And of course, if the IRR is the other way around and it's less, you'll go. No go, stay away, don't get near them. Um, so I know a lot of stuff in test. Let me just hand you back the last exam. And Professor, will you help me hand these out? All right, ladies and gentlemen, listen up. The total number of points you could have gotten on this exam was 100. The highest number of points that was scored in the class was 72. The lowest number of points that was scored was 16. Now I'm going to curve the grades because once again the goal is not to say hey everybody get 100. But obviously those who scored better, in fact five or more of you scored better than 80%. So that's good. But I'm handing this back. You can look at it. You can compare this to your exam today, which I will also grade. No, no, that's yours. Uh, I'm sorry, that's yes. Here we go. And I think this will help. Once again, this is helping me to see what you've learned what you retain, and what I've got to teach you next time. And once you get these concepts down, you're in much better shape. Carol's not here. Let me, uh, oh, she... Okay. All right, so um, look at it. Look at your current exams, and Next time we see each other, we are going to have a presentation on retail real estate. We're going to learn about credit. We're going to learn about public-private partnerships. We're going to learn about construction issues. We're going to look at development marketing. A lot to put in. We'll have that presentation. And then you all are going to give us your presentation in the afternoon. Yes, Victor. Um, are we able to ask questions, see whether or not we're going in the right direction with the presentation? Sure. Hey, Dr. Fred, they can ask me questions, can't they? Or, sir?
Victor says if they need direction. Of course. I'm here to help you and guide you as best I can. Questions? Any other questions? Does the good professor have any closing remarks or things that he needs to do? Um, I suppose whether or not we're going to do anything with regard, we've done everything for the student group, to get, we're going we're to submit the paperwork, right. that will take care of that, and then other than that, I suppose the, uh, the study tour folks, they've got all the information I think that they need to okay. figure, so I think we're good. Great. Thank what you. Was it was a 3808 curve, right? Pardon? It was a 3808 curve. That was my next book. My next question was uh, so just email. Uh, 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 so just the my next question was the highest rate of return. Oh, absolutely. That's a good question. It's the only way to go. Uh, uh,